everybody. How are you tonight? Fabulous. Glad to hear it. We've all succeeded. We've made it through another Thursday. So congratulations to all of us on adulting so well and young adulting for some of us as well. So welcome to the Josiah Henson Museum. My name is Diana. I am the education program manager here. I'm seeing a lot of new faces. So could I just do a show of hands? How many folks have been here to the museum before? And how many of y'all is this your very first time here? Splendid. So we've got a good mix of folks. If any of y'all new folks want to tell me where you heard about the event afterward, that'll help us better target all of our marketing to let you know about things coming up in the future. Since some of y'all are new, I'm going to give you like a one or two minute description of what our museum is about before bringing out the person you're actually here to see today. I'm just starved for attention, so I have to talk about myself a lot. So, our museum tells the life story of the remarkable man named Josiah Henson, who was enslaved on this very property for about 25 years before he self-emancipated himself, his wife, and his four children up to Canada. In Canada, he established a settlement for other newly emancipated people so that they could learn uh, uh, the skills needed to be self-reliant in a market economy. He taught literacy, he taught carpentry, all the skills that the new folks would need. He also, Mark tells me I'm not speaking enough into the microphone. That's because I'm loud. Sorry, y'all. Speaking into the microphone. He also then was a conductor on the Underground Railroad and took another 118 folks up with him to Canada. Not to compare it, but Harriet Tubman took 70. I'm just saying. So, Reverend Henson then did something that went from being remarkable to being world changing. He wrote one of the greatest works of literature of the 19th century that I'm sure you've all heard of. It's called The Life of Josiah Henson, formerly a slave, now an inhabitant of Canada, as narrated by himself. I can tell you've all read this book. One very important person did read this book, and her name was Harriet Beecher Stowe. She was an author herself, and she wrote a book based on the life of Josiah Henson, and her book was called Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Life Among the Lowly. It went on to be the second best-selling book of the 19th century, and was largely credited as being one of the main impetus for the American Civil War, and thus the end of slavery. So in no small part, the end of American slavery started here on the property where we are. So some folks were able to come over to the museum before we started today. We are open Fridays and Saturdays from 10 until 4 and Sundays from 12 until 4 if you want to come back and learn more. Because what you're really here today uh, is to learn from Mr. Jim Johnston. <clears throat> Jim Johnston is a lawyer, writer, and lecturer in Washington, D.C. His writings have appeared in such diverse publications as the New York Times, Muslim World, Washington Post, White House History Magazine, the Howard Law Journal, and America Lawyer Magazine. He has written three books, From Slave Ship to Harvard, Yarrow Mahmoud, and the History of an African American Family, Murder, Inc., the CIA under John F. Kennedy, and the recollections of Margaret Loughborough, a Southern woman's memories of Richmond, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. during the Civil War. So please join me in welcoming Jim Johnston. Thank you, Diana, and thank you all for coming, and um, I appreciate your coming. Um, First of all, I'm going to talk about why this presentation. I wrote two books, my, these two books. Uh, one is about a Southern woman, diehard Confederate. I'm going to read some of her racist writings. So you get the white Southern view. And Yara Mamut, who came on a slave ship uh, and went on to become a very famous man painted by Charles Wilson Peale. More or less, that's how the talk's going to be divided. But I'm going to mix both white and black views of slavery uh, in both talks. First of all, I want to distinguish slavery in the South from slavery in this area. And you know, a lot of people think that slavery in the South was like gone with the wind. That, you know, there was a good relation between white and blacks. You know, the, the black people they didn't mind being slaves, and you know it was all fine, and, and they were funny people, and it's all good. That wasn't the way it was. And this picture is a better view of slavery in the South. 
uh, the cotton fields. I think this picture was actually taken after the Civil War uh, because of the, that, how, that looks like a factory back there. But uh, it doesn't show up well, but the white guy on the horse has got a shotgun or a gun. And, you know, people were not wanting to pick the cotton. So uh, that's an important distinction. Not, it wasn't exclusively different here, but it wasn't quite that bad as you'll see. And again, people think that cotton was slavery. That was not the crop. Uh, cotton wasn't uh, a viable commercial crop until 1795 when Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. In this area, slavery and tobacco went hand in hand. And this is the tobacco plant that was uh, grown and started in Jamestown. And the important thing about tobacco was it was the cash crop. People in the colonies had, you know, there wasn't any, you couldn't get manufactured goods here. You had to buy them from England or Europe. And therefore you needed a cash crop to send to Europe to buy all the things you needed. The English really liked tobacco. You know, and I think it's very important because you know, we're trying to get rid of tobacco today. It's addictive, the nicotine is addictive. Uh, it became so, it was a worthless crop. I mean, that's the important thing to keep in mind. It was a very damaging, worthless crop that made America what it is today. You know, this is what started everything was tobacco. And that's why they then had slavery here because they needed unskilled, cheap labor, cheap in the sense you don't pay for it at all, to grow the tobacco. The other thing to remember <clears throat> in terms of this area is you got to get the tobacco to England. And so the way they did that was they'd put it in these big barrels called hogshead and they weighed about a thousand pounds. And you can't, well you can put this on a wagon, but a wagon will hold one barrel. And so instead of doing that, this is the way they would get it to a body of water. They'd roll it. And you roll it down to a creek where you could put it on a skiff or something and float it down to a larger port where an ocean-going ship could take it. The key, though, the reason I mention this is because if, you've, if you roll it like this, and I should say, if you go into Virginia, Fairfax County, there's Rolling Road. And there's Rolling Road in places in Maryland. It still kept a tradition from this. Uh, and River Road was a rolling road uh, originally. So, but... Um, if you roll it more than 10 miles, it ruins the tobacco, it crumbles. And so uh, the net effect of that was that all of the, this is the East Coast. <laughs> That's not a man with a nose. This is the East Coast in the Chesapeake Bay and the Potomac River. The net effect was all the tobacco plantations in this area were within roughly 10 miles of a body of water because otherwise they can't get it to England. There's no sense in raising a crop if you can't get it on the ocean. So as Maryland developed, the tobacco, I mean, the originally was, it was down in St. Mary's was the first of uh, Europeans in Maryland. It kept moving north until it, up the Potomac River, for example, until it got this, this little spot here. There's a 40, there was a 40 foot deep hole in the Potomac River there. There was a little creek that came out and dug that hole and that's where they could get ocean going ships anchored. That was the last port on the Potomac River, the last tobacco port. And another view of it is the Kennedy Center and Georgetown and that creek was Rock Creek. So Georgetown was the last tobacco port on the Potomac River and it ex tobacco explains a lot of things about our economy and our country. That white line, I drew it, uh, I'm not a very good <laughs> at this, but it marks sort of the end of slavery. Slavery is to the right of that, to the east of it, because if you go past that line, you get too far away from the rivers to get the tobacco to England. And you see that if you look just, I don't, if you do any history, Frederick County w didn't have much slavery. And if you get any farther west than Frederick County, there was virtually no slavery, because that wasn't a tobacco growing region. Slavery didn't make much sense except for tobacco or cotton or rice or indigo. So, I mean, there was some, but in there, here, I think Josiah Henson's farm was probably a tobacco farm, I'm not sure, yeah. 
Now, I go to my subject, Margaret Loughborough, uh, and, and there's going to be some, a little bit of strong language in parts of what she said. Here's her p portrait. This was painted by Thomas Sully. I will, you know, he was a major American portrait painter. And the R.M. Moot painting that I show on the cover of the other book was by Charles Wilson Peale. So these two books have these wonderful paintings on them. Um, she was a four-year-old girl. Uh, her family lived in Richmond. Uh, they went to New York to have, for various things, and they went, I guess maybe, maybe Sully was in Philadelphia at the time, but they went up north and they had their portraits done. And so she has this portrait done. She tells, in, in, in some sense, <clears throat> she's sort of endearing. Because she said when this portrait was done, Sully gave her a bear, stuffed bear. You know, it would be a teddy bear today, but Teddy Roosevelt wasn't born yet. So it was a bear. <laughs> uh, and she said, you know, she played with this bear while she's having her portrait painted to keep her calm. And at the end, he said, well, you can keep the bear. And she thought that was just wonderful. You know, a four-year-old girl, you know, their father had paid $18 for the portrait, and he gives her, you know, a two-penny, two-cent bear. She, uh, she was in Richmond, and her, her family was in Richmond, but her mother's mother was from uh, that part of Virginia, uh, the Shenandoah Valley, and there's a plantation down. It's, uh, th there was a big settlement of her family there. She had lots of relatives. One of her names was McClelland with a D, but they were related to Union General McClelland without the D. She was a Cabell. That's the first family of Virginia. She married a Loughborough, so that's a big Washington family. So she's, the, she's a very much Southern woman. And the McClellan family in that part of Virginia, you can see uh, Lynchburg down there, Appomattox, Charlottesville. Uh, the McClellan family in that region of Virginia had, I think, 450 slaves among them. So this is a big, big slave uh, area. This is her home in Montezuma, uh, just a, and it was a plantation. The interesting thing I discovered about her life was that although she lived in Richmond, she was born here. And the reason is, the big southern white families that had big plantations, in your eighth month, you would go to the biggest, plant, biggest house in the extended family. And this was the biggest house in the extended family because they had slaves to take care of for the woman. They had midwives. And so her mother traveled, I think, I don't know how far it is from Richmond, maybe 50 or 90 miles, traveled up. You know, as she, she's about ready to deliver. She has to travel up to this house and was given the master bedroom to deliver the child. So that was a, and I, I will say while I'm doing that, if you ever go out to Charlestown, West Virginia, you go to Zion Episcopal Church where all the Washingtons are buried. And there may be 70 or 100 Washingtons buried there. If you look at the tombstones, a lot of the tombstones will say, born Mount Vernon. George had passed away but Mount Vernon, until about 1848, was the dominant Washington house. So if you were a Washington woman and you were about ready to have a baby, you would try to go to Mount Vernon. So this is the whole Southern culture. She says this. This was in her recollections. Old Mammy, this is about her childhood. Old Mammy told the children stories, stories of Africa. Always they were of animals talking, birds and little creeping things. And they talked just like people. These were told me at bedtime. I love them. Now, this little, little segment of what she's saying is the black family, that nanny that took care of the children, would tell them stories and told them stories from Africa. Now, if you do the math, these people, the nanny could not have been from Africa, but it meant that black families in the South were handing down stories from Africa and they were passing them on to the white children. And that's remarkable. You know, just, so she's giving us a little, sort of a positive view of it. Uh, with her last son. And this is a, these things come alive to me. His daughter emailed me last week. <laughs> so I mean, 
this is a photo. This picture was taken about 1890, and that boy, you know, had a marriage, late life marriage, and his daughter is still alive. So I mean, these aren't, you know, this is history, but they are real in a many sense. Now, there's the racist language. This is Margaret writing. Her book was for the Daughters of the Confederacy after the Civil War. And this is, you know, she believed in slavery. She believed in the lost cause. And this is what she says for you. This is her message for you. Let me record now for the benefit of future generations a scene that can never occur again in this country. Thank God. I was sitting by my uncle, fanning him. He was dying. The room was large and his bed in the middle of it. I heard a noise at the door and found there the old Negro coachman who said he had heard young master was dying and all his people wanted to say goodbye. They came in first, the men, plantation hands, old and young. Now they had taken, they had taken off their shoes and one by one they passed around the bed, putting their black hands on his as it lay on the bed and with tears rolling down their faces, each one with a few words such as, Goodbye, Marster, you surely have been good to us. God bless you, etc. And he was one of the cruel masters the Union troops were fighting. So these people are defending slavery. She was, to her last, going to defend slavery. They, she thought this was good. And that's important to understand the white slave mentality. This is, she was in Richmond for most of the Civil War. And the Loughborough family is a Washington, D.C. family, very wealthy. You're going to see that in a minute. But uh, she married into the Loughborough family. Her husband fought for the Confederacy. He was a Washingtonian who went south to fight for the Confederacy. She stayed in Richmond. And as the war got to its end, he kept saying, get out, get out, get out. <laughs> Richmond's going to fall. And Richmond, you know, this is what Richmond looked like at the end of the war. So she left right at the end to come up to Washington to be with her uh, husband's family. And they have a, I'm going to show you the, no, I'm not. I'm going to show you their house. Um, to do that, she had a pass from Abraham Lincoln himself, because the family was so prominent, to allow her to come north. Otherwise, you couldn't come north. You couldn't go between north and south. And to do that, you had to go through what they called the exchange point. And that's where they exchanged Union and Confederate prisoners of war. So it was all this controlled. And this is what she wrote about that. When we got to the exchange point, moving out of Richmond, there was a large U.S. war vessel, which was the home of Colonel Mulford, U.S. Commissioner of Exchange. Near it were two others full of Confederate prisoners. Colonel Mulford uh, came on board our boat, and Colonel Old introduced me, saying he would answer for me that the letters I carried the pass were all right. I then went into the US, exchange U.S. boat, where, to my horror, I saw Negroes in uniform on equal terms with the white soldiers and sailors. I had never seen one being a black person before who was not a slave. This is what the South is all about. And she says to her horror, what she saw was that. This is the USS, not the specific ship. The uh, United States Navy was never segregated. It was always an integrated force basically because people didn't want to go on ships because it was too dangerous, and that was a good route out for black people. So this was the, uh, what she saw, and she, this was terrified her to see that. I will also say, she also wrote that her grandmother, at the end of the war, when the Union troops are coming, her grandmother was very afraid that they were going to steal her silver. You know, they were going to loot. That was down at Montezuma. So she called in the slaves and she said, bury the silver in the yard because the Union troops are coming. So the slaves took the silver out and buried it in the yard. The Union troops came and the slaves said, hey, the silver's buried here. <laughs> this was a Loughborough house. It's um, in Washington, D.C. It was one of the grand houses in Washington. It's up by American University. It's the NBC studio now, if you, by Tenley Town. Uh, it, in fact, NBC tore it down to put their studio up. But um, it was considered a very elegant house. And 
her father-in-law was called Hamilton Loughborough. And here's his uh, 1860 census. He's worth, uh, his land I think is worth 40,000 and he's personally worth 4,000. A lot of money in those days. And these are all the families. But in the 18, you know, the Constitution said, congressmen shall be apportioned according to the population. White people count one, slaves count three quarters. And so, where is it, three fifths? Three fifths, I think. Slaves count three fifths. So not only did they do a census for white people, but they did a slave census. And here is the slave census, separate census. And I, I, th I don't think you can quite read this, but um, basically Hamilton Loughborough only owned three slaves. He had 250 acres, only owned three slaves. All of these the slaves down, the second group of slaves, are rented. He, 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 paid, he rented them out from somebody else. And so you're starting to see the difference between the Deep South, where all the slaves were owned, and Washington, D.C., this area, where slaves could be rented out. Now, these are human beings. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like Hertz Rent-A-Slave. I mean, it's just incredible, but it was like a car. And if you were a black person, you could be rented out to someone else. And that's what he did. In 1862, during the Civil War, Congress passed the law to free the slaves in Washington, D.C., only in Washington, D.C. And the mechanism was that uh, the owners would go to the court and they'd file a piece of paper with the names of their slaves and some identifying information. And these are Hamilton Loughborough's slaves that he's itemized. The first one is a 38-year-old man who's lame, not very valuable. And then a woman with four young children, not very valuable. But that piece of paper, it was, what they did was incredible. They went up to from Baltimore to come down to Washington, and they'd show them these pieces of paper, and the slave traders then would tell how much they were worth, and that's how much the government would pay the owner for the slaves. These slaves obviously aren't very valuable. Uh, Hamilton Loughborough owned property in Montgomery County as well as D.C. I think, knowing the family, that he took his good slaves and moved them out to Montgomery County so he wouldn't have to free them and brought the bad slaves into D.C because the government was going to buy them. He probably couldn't sell these slaves uh, in that condition. And Ira Berlin, who taught at the University of Maryland, uh, said this about this whole process of urban slavery. Urban slaves, unlike their plantation counterparts, lived literally on, literally on top of or beside their owners or other white people in attics, back rooms, and closets. If you imagine Georgetown had slaves, those townhouses, and you've got slaves in there. The comparative smallness of city houses, shared residence, and disproportionately large number of women at a time when men dominated the plantation population allowed urban slaves a measure of independence unknown to their rural counterparts. As domestics, laborers, and especially skilled tradesmen and tradeswomen, they moved freely through the towns, often as hirelings, rented from one master to another. Sometimes they rented themselves, collecting their own wages and living independently of owner or hirer. The Loughborough House is still in existence. I mean, one of the many, several Loughborough houses still exists. It was built mainly in 1848 before the Civil War. I went a tour through it. Outside the mistress's bedroom is an area about this big, and that's where her slave lived. And she had to be at the beck and call of the, her mistress, and she had to sleep right outside the bedroom. So I mean, that's what they're talking about, living right on top of uh, the white people. Now I'm going to finish with that and move on to Yara Mamut. Came on a slave ship from Africa and then eventually was freed. This is one uh, portrait of him by James Alexander Simpson in Georgetown. This portrait is at the Georgetown Public Library. But Charles Wilson Peale <laughs> did this portrait of him. You know. He was a free man by the time these portraits were done, but he came in 1752 and was freed in 1796. Uh, the slave trader who was bringing people from Africa, we had our own little slave trader right here in the Washington, D.C. area. He lived in Bladensburg. This house is called Bostwick. Uh, 
and his name was Christopher Lowndes. And that house was built in part with money from the slave trade. And he was the one who brought Yarmamut to America. Um, and this is the ad in the Maryland Gazette for Yarmamut's ship coming in. Just imported in the Elijah, Captain James Lau, directly from the coast of Africa. A parcel of healthy slaves consisting of men, women, and children, and will be disposed of on board the said vessel in the Severn River in Annapolis. On Thursday, the fourth day of June, for sterling money, bills of exchange, gold or paper currency, Benjamin Tasker Jr. and Christopher Lowndes, the man I mentioned. Tasker, these men were brothers-in-law. Lowndes had married Tasker's sister. Tasker's father was the governor of Maryland. So the slave trader's father, the guys profiting from the transatlantic slave trade, is the son of the governor of Maryland. So you can see that very southern part of uh, Maryland. In 1811, uh, well, this book was published in 1816, but it was 1811, this guy came from Europe and he did this study of slavery in America because he thought it was pretty interesting. And this is, you know, if anybody here is an economist, you'll really groove to this. I sort of like it because I, but anyway, he's trying to tell you what, how much it costs to have a slave. And he says, well, a slave's going to cost you $500. Okay, so you pay out $500. Well, if you put that money in the bank, you could get 6% interest. So that's $30 you're losing by buying a slave. It's called opportunity cost in economics. And then he goes through the rest of it. You know, you, in the event of accident, another $30. You know, a slave might die. You pay $500 and, and he dies and you know, got nothing. And then he talks about a peck of Indian corn and, and how much it costs. 10 pounds of salt meat per week, I mean two pounds of salt meat per week, a barrel of fish per year, and he goes through all these, he finally comes up with it all, it's gonna cost $98. Okay, so if you buy a slave, it's gonna cost you $98 a year. How much is that slave gonna bring in as an urban slave? He does this calculation and it basically comes out to be $60. So you're paying $98 to get $60. So you see why slavery is starting to die out, dies out in an urban area. It just doesn't make economic sense. A lot of people kept going because, especially older people, you know, it was Medicare for older people to have a slave to take care of you. And then slave housing. I'm watching my time. Slave housing. Yarmamut lived in Georgetown. He had a log house. This was a log house at a park in Virginia that's now closed, but it's just a log cabin with siding over it and pitch. But it's warmer, keeps the wind out. This uh, Yarmamut went up to uh, Sharpsburg uh, with his owner for many years. And on that farm, this building was, I said to the owner of the person who owns it today, that looks like a slave quarters. He said, no, it was an outbuilding. I said, now, you know, it's got a stone base. And, you know, with a log cabin, the termites eat it. So log cabins don't last very long, but this is essentially a log cabin on a stone foundation to keep the termites uh, from chewing it up. But I think, you know, that might have been the kind of place he lived there. Another one uh, I talk about in my book this is in uh, Pleasant Valley, Maryland, up by Harper's Ferry. And this is on the uh, Crampton Farm. If any of you are Civil War buffs, there's Crampton's Gap. This is where that is. And uh, this was the slave quarters. And I said to the owner of the farm, he said, that's the slave quarters, and that chimney is a bakehouse. And I said, that looks like a spring house to me with that little window in the bottom and, you know, sort of the, looks like there's a course of water there. He said, my family has owned this property since 1865, and it's always been called the slave quarters. And so this is up in the colder regions where you clearly want to have uh, a stone house. But here you've seen what Josiah Henson had. And he, in fact, complained about the wind blowing through and how cold it was because they, they didn't chink, chink it very well. And so these stone houses were much better, or a log house instead of a log cabin is better. And then, in Rockville, was Hungerford's Tavern. And in my study of Yarmouth Mood, I identified that 
it appeared that several African slaves lived, people who had come from Africa who were Muslim. And I'm sorry, I didn't tell you, Yarmamut was Muslim, but um, several Muslims worked there as slaves. So I think that that was pretty common to have slaves working in a tavern. I joked that they liked Muslims because Muslims wouldn't drink up the prophet. You know, they're not going to drink up the booze. And speaking of booze, alcohol and slavery. The guy who wrote this stuff about the economics of slavery also wrote this. And again, this is racist. In some of the taverns, the slaves sleep on the floor of the dining room, which the master, for obvious reasons, ought to forbid. The slaves have an uncommon desire for spiritus liquors. You know, really nice, good racist talk. Black people drink too much. But I'm going to save that because I've got a quote from Josiah Henson. And here's what he said about drinking. My master, and this is the guy who lived here. Here's what he said about Rockville. My master's habits were such as were common enough among the dissipated planters of the neighborhood. And one of their frequent practices was to assemble on Saturday or Sunday, which were their holidays, and gamble, run horses, or fight gamecocks, discuss politics, and drink whiskey and brandy and water all day long, perfectly aware that they would not be able to find their own way home at night. Each one ordered his body servant to come after him and help him home. I've held my owner in his saddle or on his horse when he could not hold himself in the saddle and walked by his side in darkness and mud from the tavern to his house. Quarrels and brawls of the most frequent description were, uh, of re violent description, were frequent consequences of these meetings. And whenever they became especially dangerous and glasses were thrown, dirks drawn, and pistols fired, it was up, it was the duty of the uh, slaves to rush in and each one drag his master from the fight and carry him home. Now, Hungerford Tavern, where the drinking would have occurred, is in downtown Rockville. It's gone now. But, you know, our distance from Rockville, he would have to bring his master home on a horse and put him to bed. Religion and factory towns. These two quotes I found about Georgetown. Christmas was a great time of year for Negroes. Ordinarily, they were not allowed in the streets. There was a curfew after the town bell rang at 9 o'clock at night. But at Christmas, this restriction was removed, and as midnight approached, bands of them would go through the streets singing hymns and carols before the houses of the white <laughs> friends. The next morning, the next morning, I'm going to break my laptop. The next morning, the leader of the band called at the house's and received a token of appreciation in the way of a small coin. So that's one author said. David Warden, the guy who's talking about blacks in Georgetown, said this. On Christmas, Yaramut's great delight is to fire a gun under the respectable families of Georgetown's windows at the break of day, which is intended as a signal for his dram. So he's the one who is the leader of this caroling group. So you imagine in Georgetown, Blacks, both slave and free, go around Christmas Eve caroling, and the next morning, Yarmamut goes around with a shotgun and fires it off as a signal to get paid. And that tells something about him that he's trusted both by the blacks and the whites. The whites rely on him to be honest, and the black community also requires him, believes that he's honest. So you have this very brief, good relations on Christmas Eve. But I also found this from about 18, this is about uh, 1811, from 1845 period. Um, and this from, from a newspaper. An 1845 Georgetown uh, ordinance allowed religious assemblages conducted by and under the supervision and control of white men appointed uh, by either or, or any of the established churches. And tr they had to terminate at 9 o'clock. So... Black people could go to church if that church had a white minister appointed by one of the existing churches. And the service had to be over by 9 o'clock on Sunday. The penalties for this were 39 lashes and thir 30 days in the workhouse or a $20 fine for free blacks. The mayor could waive the conditions, though. And then 
it's uh, doing all my research. Black people just got tired of having white ministers. It was just not very relevant to their life. So one time they bring a black pastor down from New York to give the service. But um, after s several of the services, they were arrested for violating that law. And they got a couple of days in jail. Uh, but they petitioned the mayor uh, for a waiver saying, you know, we want to have a black minister. And so the mayor said, okay, but the service still has to be over by 9 o'clock. And so um, it wasn't, and they got arrested again. So they go to court, and they got off on a te legal technicality. That's a great deal different from the South. <laughs> you know, nobody in the South is going to do this kind of negotiations with the black community. And this is Georgetown in around 1845. And so there is, you start seeing black people are having leverage, whether they're slaves or free. They've got leverage over the white people because they've got lawyers, they'll hire white lawyers, and they can, you know, put pressure on. Uh, it was not Mount Zion. <laughs> I know that. Yes. I, it was the predecessor to Mount Zion. It might have been. No, because it was the, uh, it, it might have been. It wasn't that building, I don't think. Then the, the factory towns. Part of my research took me up to Antietam and the Antietam Iron Works, which was a, you know, a fact, it forged iron, it pounded iron. And in that community, Mr. Brin was the manager. He hired free blacks. And there's a minister who went around, you know, a circuit riding minister, the Reverend Thomas, circuit riding ministers, if you don't know, they would ride around in, you know, 10 or 15 towns showing up every third or fourth Sunday to do services for the black community. And so that was the way uh, Reverend Thomas did. And he talks about Antietam Ironworks. And this, this is still up there if you go up there. And he says this. This place was said to be one of the wickedest places in Washington County prior to my taking charge of the circuit, which takes in this place. Mr. Brin told me that he had a very fine set of young black men there to work and attend to his business. And said he, I am very glad that you've come among them to teach them the way to live. He further said that he did not wish any of his men to marry slave women. And he would, uh, he would rather they should marry free women and bring them on the place. And he would there take care of them that he might do and care, of them, care for them as he liked. He stated further that he had plenty of uh, land and timber to build them houses just as they wished to have them built he further gave them more pri privileges than any white man had on his place. 1820 times. So again, quite different from the South. You know, you're seeing a, a, a start of an industrial place. You know, Antietam Iron Works is in the middle of nowhere. Still, you've got uh, this factory town where, you know, you see it much later with white people in the West, but it was happening right here. They were, these were free men. Now, the subject of manumission, because you, you, know, you always hear about man, manumission is a word for freeing people, freeing slaves. They always, you get bluffed out by genealogists who talk about, well, he's not manumitted. It was far more complicated than that. And let me first start by making the analogy to a driver's license. You don't need a driver's license to drive. You know, you don't need to be free <laughs> You don't need to be manumitted to be free. We're all born free. It's just a stupid law. And it, the driver's license laws aren't so stupid, but slavery was stupid. So, you know, most of the slaves, probably all the slaves, thought they were free. It was just the slavery problem. So that's the way it was. And so you can get manumitted many, many ways. Here is Yarrow Mamut's manumission in Montgomery County. You know, it's a recorder of deeds. And... What Yaramamut did, uh, sort of unusual, because he took and filed it with the recorder of deeds as though it were a land record. And I'm going to explain why he did that later. A lot of black people wouldn't do that because it costs money. Also, you see that um, it's signed by Upton Bell. And people who don't know what they're doing would say Upton Bell uh, owned Yaramamut. He never owned Yaramamut. Upton Bell was the clerk of the court in Rockville. 
the Bell family generally owned Yara Mahmood, and they told him verbally, go free. But then they died. The guy who told him that died. And so somehow or other, they have to honor it. And, and Upton Bell was a relative, but he didn't, want, he didn't inherit Yara. But he's clerk of the court. Nobody's going to argue if he signs a manumission. And so that's the way Yara Mahmood's manumission looks. But here's a different, here's why you file it. This was told by Reverend uh, W.C. Pennington, who fled north, a runaway slave. He wrote about walking along the National Turnpike towards Baltimore. That's Highway 40. He met a man with whom he had this exchange. The man says, are you traveling any distance, my friend? Pennington, I'm on my way to Philadelphia. Are you free? Yes, sir. I suppose then that you have... Uh, provided you've been provided with papers. No, sir, I, I have no papers. Well, my friend, you should not travel on this road. You will be taken up before you have gone three miles. There are men living on this road who are constantly on the lookout for your people, and it is seldom that one escapes them who attempts to uh, pass by day. So if you're a black person, you can't travel. You start traveling on a road away from your town, and people are going to say, hey, are you free? And you say, if you've got a piece of paper, you can show them the paper. And, and they would tend to honor it in Maryland. But who's going to keep a piece of paper with them? And, you know, you're going to lose it. And if you can't read, why do you think this piece of paper is going to really help? So what you do is you go to the recorder of deeds and you file that piece of paper. So say the sheriff of Howard County takes you up. And he's going to throw you in jail if you can't show that you're free. But, and the sheriffs would honor, the slave, would, the free black would say, I, I've been manumitted down in Montgomery County. And so the sheriff would write the clerk of the court at Montgomery County and said, is Jim Johnston free? And the clerk would write back saying, yes, he is. And you'd get out of jail. So most of the genealogy people focus on these manumission papers. But in fact, many ways people were, were manumitted or freed was in a will. I, I'm going to free Henry. I'm going to free J Joe. You wouldn't have a manumission paper. Or sometimes they just say, hey, Jim, go free. I'm you know, it's time for you to go. And the ex-slave would just go off, and he wouldn't have any proof. And sometimes they'd just run away. <laughs> and so you have this whole big group of people who don't have recorded manumissions, but they either live as free or they were freed. But it's sort of a silly nonsense. President up in Middletown, Maryland, wrote this about uh, slavery. I've seen the, uh, these were, uh, he's talking about what are called really Georgia men, because they would take slaves and down to Georgia and sell them. And they'd either take runaways or they'd take buy slaves. I've seen from 20 to 40 Negroes handcuffed together, one on each side to a long chain. The George men, as they, were, as they called them, then with his whip, driving them. They paid when markets were good high prices, from 600 to 1,200 per man, and five to 800 for women, especially if they were young and good looking. There was men that followed it for a living. They took them to Georgia and sold them to work on cotton farms. At the time, there was very few people, but what thought it was all right. And I thought, if a Negro run away, I was in duty bound to catch him, as if a horse or anything else ran away. This is the average mentality of Maryland. You know, these people didn't own slaves, but they were going to do the right thing and help with slaves. One of the slaves I, I read about did run away, and he's running down the road, and he's getting away. And then he sees his town, and he runs into the town, except the blacksmith comes out, and this huge white man grabs him and holds him for the sheriff. So this was a really a big, big problem. Yes, ma'am. Oh, this is, that, that quote, that was written after the Civil War, so probably 1840, 1850. John Brown, uh, I love this painting. Uh, so John Brown in 1859 seizes Harper Ferry and calls for a slave revolt. One of the, the it got, the word got around that it was free blacks that were leading these slave revolts. So they decided, God bless the Maryland legislature, dominated by the Eastern Shore tobacco interest, 
decided they were going to end manumissions once and for all. And this was the law they passed in response to John Brown's raid. No slave shall henceforth be manumitted by deed or by last will and testament, nor shall the fact of a Negro going at large and acting as free or not being claimed by an owner be considered as evidence of the execution heretofore for any deed or will manumitting the party or as grounds for presuming freedom. The law was passed in response to the John Brown raid. It was in 1859. The Maryland legislature passed this law in early 1860, you know, right before the Civil War. But even today, Maryland laws don't take effect, most of them, until July 1st. So if this was passed in 1860, January, it didn't take effect until uh, J July 1st, 1860. So when I was doing my research, I, on one of the families, I discovered that they had this manumission. It doesn't, you don't have to read it. They had this manumission filed. Man freed his wife and his six kids. It was filed in May, 1860. But as I was going through the deed book, I saw there were a lot of manumissions. And I realized that Maryland had passed the law outlawing, outlawing manumissions. But because it didn't take effect until July 1st, every black person in Maryland was trying to get manumitted before that deadline. And so the deed book in Washington County was just full of these manumissions. Education. And I, I'm, I'm getting close to the end. We go back to Georgia. Georgia law on education. Punishment for teaching slaves or free persons of color to read. If any slave, Negro, or free person of color, or any white person shall teach any other slave, Negro, or free person of color to read, or write either written or printed characters, the said free person of color or slave shall be punished by fine and whipping, or fine or whipping at the discretion of the court. They, they really liked that whipping stuff. I mean, that, that seemed to be. So in Georgia, it was illegal. Notice, though, only black people could be punished. If a white person taught a black person to, to read, that was illegal, but no punishment went with it. So that's the way it was in Georgia. Maryland didn't have that law, although Frederick Douglass said, you know, that it was against policy in, in Maryland although his family in Baltimore did teach him to read. But this was by the same guy who's talking about Washington in 1811, about two miles from Georgetown on a hill of steep ascent, elevated about 100 feet above the level of the river. There's a nursery of trees belonging to Mr. Maine. Mr. Maine employs five or six young blacks to cultivate his nursery, whom he nourishes, educates, and rewards with the annual sum of $64. During hours consecrated to repose, he teaches them to read and write and instructs them in moral duties. Joseph Moore, a manumitted black who lived with him several years, is now a respectable grocer in Georgetown. So blacks were reading in, George, reading in Georgetown. And then there's this I found in the newspaper. There was a school for black girls in Georgetown. This is 1815 to 1830. There are... The, there are those living who remember the troop of girls dressed uniformly, which was wont to follow in procession their pious and refined teacher to uh, devotions on the Sabbath at Holy Trinity Church in Georgetown. The stool comprised girls from the best colored families of Georgetown, Washington, Alexandria, and surrounding countries. The sisters of Georgetown Covenant were the admirers of Miss Beecroft, a black woman who ran it, and gave her instructions and, and so forth. So in the 1820s, African-American girls had a way to get re-educated in Georgetown. You know, this is quite different from the South. This isn't in Alabama. This isn't Georgia. They were teaching black girls to read. And it was pretty sophisticated. And in fact, one of my current research projects is someone who went to that school. Uh, her name is Mary Ann Tritt Castle. And she was painted by the same guy that painted Yara Mamut. You can see this is a girl a woman now, uh, who went to that school because I know she could read. Uh, she read, ran hospitals and things. Things, you know, it's virtually unheard of. But there were these exceptions, uh, such as her. Yara Mamut's son moved up to Pleasant Valley in Washington County, and there is a road up there called Yarrowsburg Road, named after 
his son's wife, who was the midwife, Mrs. Yarrow's house. And so his son moves up there in 1825 uh, and then dies in 1832. And so I went up, with his son had enough property, I went up and I got the inventory of his estate. He had a lot of books. You know, if you're a farmer in the middle of a farm in a rural area, why would you have books? Because you can read. You know, if you can't read, you're not going to have books. So I think Yara Mamut made sure his son could read too. Military service. In my research, I got into the Civil War, into the Yarmouth's son married into a family, the Turners, and one of the Turners joined the Union Army. You don't, you may not know the uh, Emancipation Proclamation not only freed the slaves in the South, but it provided that blacks could join the Union Army. I mean, it's explicitly said they can join the Union Army. Up to that point, the Navy had been integrated, but the Army wasn't. So they formed these regiments of black soldiers. They were, it, it was not integrated. They had separate regiments. But uh, that tall guy in the center there, I speculate, is uh, Simon Turner. And I've got his story. But, and this was the 39th Regiment, U.S. Colored Troops. Usually the, the African-American units did supply and quartermaster and, and things. But the 39th Regiment fought at the Battle of the Crater, and they were a combat unit. Now, we go back to Georgia and Atlanta being burned by Sherman's troops. This is a famous photograph at the Library of Congress. Somebody colorized it, and I like it because it's in color. I'm going to show you black and white in a minute. But, you know, the humor is it's auction and Negro sales, and there's a black trooper there sitting there under that sign. And... There it is in black and white as it was originally photographed. But if you go up close, you can see he's reading a book. So you imagine in Georgia, where blacks were not allowed, it was against the law to teach blacks to read. When Sherman comes through, not only did he burn Atlanta, he had black troops that the son of guns read. You know, so this is just outrageous kind of thing to the Georgians to have, you know, come down and occupy an army with blacks who could read. The remnants of slavery in Montgomery County, I've marked, usually marked by the churches, and the, it follows the river as the slave economy went up. Uh, a Kephart slave pen, there was a slave pen right up in Frederick County, and then Yarrowsburg, where I talk about Yarramamut, and that was pretty much the end of slavery going up the Potomac River. And these churches marked the spot going from top left, uh, Macedonia Baptist Church on River Road, that was uh, started by the slaves from the Loughborough Plantation that were freed. Uh, Gibson Grove on the, um, Seven Locks, that church is closed, but it was a black community there that worked at the uh, stone quarry there. Uh, I have got over there and they left um, Scotland. That church got destroyed or got damaged severely, and they're trying to raise money to restore it. But there were these two black churches on uh, Seven Locks Road. Seneca, this is a new building, but there's always been a black community in Seneca, and it's marked by that church. Sugar Land up the Monocacy Valley, that's a heritage site and a very important place. Uh, Warren Church, which is at the Potomac by um, White's uh, Ferry, near White's Ferry, that church isn't functioning, but they have rehabilitated the building. Uh, St. Mark's in Boyd's, when I was up there, during the pandemic, it was closed. And then finally, Mount Moriah at Yarrowsburg. And you can see that stone house there, uh, stone church. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second. In going from slave ship to Harvard with my book, how did, and this is the final bit, how did they, it's the story of education, really. And Yara Mahmoud could read and write in Arabic. So I, I have his signature in Arabic. So he was literate. His son, his son lived, here's a Pleasant Valley. His son lived up there. You can't see at the top, it says Mrs. Yarrow's house. That's where his uh, son's wife lived. And then Simon Turner is that green block. And then that red block is right after the Civil War in 1867. They started a school for blacks.
and this was done on their own. Just the community said, we need a school. And one of the men who did that was Robert Anderson. And I love this portrait. He's still at the Macedonia Baptist Church. He was a stonemason. <laughs> He's a big guy. And he had the wherewithal to organize his community, start a school, and then found that church. Um, and he was illiterate. He signed the deed with an X. And there's Mount Moriah Church up in uh, Yarrowsburg. Then uh, one of the girls from that family, that Turner family, was Emma Turner Ford. She was raised in slavery. She knew, or no, she was, she was born after slavery ended. But she went to that school and got an education there. But in, um, that school ended in eighth grade. So her parents paid to send her to store preparatory school in Harpers Ferry and then store college. So she got a college degree. First one in the family to get a college degree. And then her son, Robert Turner Ford, went to Harvard in 1923. So it's this education. It really is how important education was in changing things. And so with that, I wrap this up and I want to thank you.